doing, John? Yeah. I've done better. Tried to pass you the camera back? Right. Which I figured you were done filming at that point. I got in there, I got my tank back on, and I pulled a big piece of wreckage from the, uh, the starboard diesel motor. Right. Yeah, a piece of manifold or something. It wasn't a pipe. Accidentally? Well, yeah, I didn't do it on purpose. No, because when you went in, you kicked a piece off. It's going to be on the video, and it hit me. And that's a why big, you... A big, long a piece big... of heavy steel? And I tried to get out from underneath it, and then it, like, swung down around and uh, landed in my lap. And I wasn't so heavy, I couldn't lift it up. But I couldn't get it off of me. So what did you do for 20 minutes on the other side of the engine? I'm not I being got, a wise I, got, I spent the whole, the whole dive trying to get the steel off of me. Did you see my light every so many minutes come by and swing the light? Oh, uh, yeah, somehow that didn't warm my heart. <laughs> it was like, Pinned down by a piece of wreckage, John is lucky to escape with his life. Something wasn't going right, but I didn't know The next morning, he'll try again. With John past the obstruction, Richie hands him the camera. Now holding the camera, John swims through the door to the rear of the diesels and, for the first time, enters the electric motor room. On the right, controls for the electric motor. A fuse panel. Spare parts boxes. If John can break them loose without causing debris to collapse, one of these may finally identify the wreck. Back at the obstruction, Richie has been waiting nearly 20 minutes. The memory of yesterday's near disaster fresh in his mind. At last, John reappears with a box. He hands it to Richie. They send it up on a lift bag. The bag make it up, Jack? Bag's up. All right. It went right according to plan. John went in. I stayed on top of the obstruction. It seemed like forever. And all of a sudden, he came back. I see his light flickering in the distance. He just hands me this big green bag. And it's so heavy that I had to kind of like lump myself out of the wreck. I got the one box out, handed it to Richie. Yeah. I went in for the second box. I couldn't break it free. Then I went to go out. Did it back come up? Yeah. 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 Well, we got one box out. There's, there's a bunch more down there. I wanted to get as many shots as this as I can, but we'll take a look and see what we got. Tag. John, you got tag. Tag. One, tag. 117. 117. That's not a U boat number, though. No, no. Got a hand on the bottom. Oh, well, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Right here. Right here. What does it say? U869. All right. Get out. That's right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Interestingly enough, I think it took us longer to identify this wreck than it did to actually fight the war. So. <laughs> Absolutely, positively, this is the U-869. We've got uh, the schematic diagram showing that it's uh, a Type 9C uh, 40. Knife. We've got the Horenberg knife, which places Martin Horenberg um, on, on this ship. We've got the tag here that says U-869 which was, historically speaking, the ship that Horenberg was on, but the U-869 is listed as being sunk off Africa. And this rules it out. 
it, it's it's definitely beyond any shadow of a doubt the 869. The page of history that uh -huh. has the 869 sunk off the coast of Gibraltar has got to be rewritten. Yeah. <laughs> After six years and three deaths, the divers have finally identified the mystery wreck. U-869. But now, a new mystery emerges. Why was U-869, Martin Hornberg's boat, here instead of Africa? The final entry in U-869's war diary has the boat leaving for her first patrol on the 23rd of November, 1944. Just two and a half years since the U-boat's triumph in Operation Drumbeat. Now, Drumbeat and the Happy Times were little more than distant memories from a far different war. U-boat commander Dernitz had originally planned only to fight England. He had never envisioned what it would mean to face the United States as well. Most of the uh, German military and political uh, elite uh, underestimated the uh, capacity and the resources of the United States of America. One of America's most important resources is science. At universities and research centers, scientific teams are developing new technologies to hunt U-boats. And they initiated a fairly heavy effort on this, including MIT, Harvard Underwater Sound Laboratory, Columbia University, Western Electric, Bell Labs, sort of an all-to-the-wall effort. One focus of the scientific effort is radar. Since the 1930s, German scientists have also been working on radar. Though aware of this work, Dernitz fails to appreciate the magnitude of the threat. He rather ignored the comments of an observer who pointed out that much of his surface operations would be detected by radar, which was then being developed by all the navies. And Dernitz sloughed that off, saying, well, we're not going to worry about that. All of a sudden during the war, there uh, was a tendency that, that we were surprised by aircraft without knowing how they could find us. Slowly, slowly it developed that, yes, they must have a radar. Beyond radar, Dernitz's greatest miscalculation is his obsessive use of radio. He sends some boats as many as 70 messages a day. Dernitz uh, was rather nosy. He wanted to know from us quite often how we were doing, where we were, and all this sort of thing. The constant radio traffic exposes the U-boats to Allied High Frequency Direction Finding, or HUFDUF. If a U-boat uses its radio, HUFDUF can pinpoint its position using triangulation. If we send any signals whatsoever from our submarine, we practically were giving away our location at that time. Together, radar and huff-duff forced the U-boats to submerge. And a submerged U-boat is too slow to catch a target. It is also too slow to escape. The ships above are hunting it with sound. All the men can do is remain silent. We um, try to be as quiet as possible inside the boat. We took our shoes off. We were only walking around in socks, and uh, anybody who dared to cough or drop a spoon was immediately ostracized and considered to be an absolute enemy of the boat. When an escort locates a U-boat, the depth charging begins. It is a scary experience to hear a depth charge dropping into the water and then expect in about five or 10 seconds an explosion to go off, which one does not know at this particular time, one will survive. After the explosion goes off, then, of course, the next one is already coming. 
and this can go on for 10 hours at a time with hundreds of depth charges and each one of those is really quite a strain on your nerves because all you're doing is is sitting and waiting for something to happen there's nothing you can do you can just sit there and wait Slowly, but inexorably, the Allies are gaining the upper hand. The turning point comes in a single month the U-boat men will forever remember as Black May. May 43, when in one month, 41 submarines were destroyed. The Hunters of the early years had become the hunted of the latter years. The happy times had changed to what we called the the saure Gurkenzeit or sour pickle time. We didn't have any fun out there anymore. In the autumn of 1943, a crisis in morale began to develop within the U-boat service, simply because there was the obvious recognition that they were outmatched by the Allies. It became very questionable, why do we go out there? Uh, when our uh, flotilla chief could say to us when we left, never mind sinking ships, just come back, please. Coming back is getting harder and harder to do. Aircraft now patrol the entire ocean. The only way to avoid them is to remain constantly submerged. But that is impossible. A U-boat of that period, as earlier in the war, had to spend at least four hours on the surface every 24 hours in order to recharge its battery. By late 1943, the omnipresence of Allied aircraft had eliminated all safe areas in the ocean. Even at night or in a dense fog, an airplane with radar can detect a U-boat on the surface. Strangely, U-boat command has long ignored a Dutch device that allows a submarine to remain submerged. Finally, belatedly, the U-boat command introduced the mass use of the snorkel very simple device and one that did not significantly improve operational performance, but which at least allowed U-boats to recharge their batteries while submerged without danger of attack. The snorkel is a mast that can be raised like a periscope. It sucks fresh air into the boat for the diesels and the crew and vents poisonous exhaust out. The snorkel allows U-boats to stay hidden, but their slow underwater speed cripples their ability to hunt. What Dernitz really needs is a design revolution, a vessel that can remain constantly underwater. The concept argues that we have a submarine, a vessel whose natural habitat is below the surface and not on the surface. It's a step out of necessity because on the surface means death. A true submarine has long been the dream of Professor Helmuth Volter. Since the 1930s, he has been working on a turbine that runs off hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Since this fuel contains its own oxygen, the engine needs no outside air. For underwater speed, he uses a highly streamlined hull. During 1940, in utmost secrecy, a Volter prototype is tested and reaches an astounding 30 knots underwater, four times faster than any submarine in the world. But hydrogen peroxide is desperately needed for Hitler's V-2 rockets. Work on the Volter turbine grinds to a halt 